This is not any kind of a rebuke, you understand? Depression or being depressed is a clinical word whose mother is psychiatry. And this word carries along a lot of baggage with it that is very, very harmful to the human spirit. I understand about the experience, but it's called being cast down or being downcast. That's a, that's a scriptural word for this type of experience. And I recommend for periods of, of this uh, to read the Psalms because David experienced these, what we're talking about here. He experienced those times, and then he said it mm -hmm. in words that will resonate in your spirit, and they'll bring strength to you. Because this downcast is like a, it's like a, it's a temptation. Is what it is. It's a, it's a different kind of temptation, in which the our, our prince of darkness seeks to debilitate the soul and just kind of get you limp. In your spirit, and if you know what it is, and you know how to pray, like sometimes Paul, would, Peter, would, uh, David would call it being downcast. Sometimes he said it's like waves coming over, like waves of a storm water coming over him. Sometimes it's like deep, calling to deep. There's things you just you just can't explain it, but it's a miserable feeling and as his storms assault the soul and but he'll David will s refer to these in the Psalms and that's what that's what we experience so we experience these times so it, I say that because sometimes if we use the wrong word it's like a it's like a hammer it's like self <laughs> flagellation because it, it it doesn't carry the proper concept it's a temptation it's an attempt for Satan to drag you down. But if you don't know what it is, you won't know how to react to it. And it'll be very, very discouraging to you. I mean, even when you know what it is, it's discouraging. Even when you know what it is, it's being cast out. But I say that so we can help one another, you know, to talk about these experiences the right way. We understand, we've all had to learn in this area, so this is not something to be ashamed of or anything like that. Uh -huh. It's just, uh, this is part of our growth in Christ, is there are common experiences to us all, but Satan doesn't want you to think it's common. Yeah. Yeah. And so he will, he tries to capitalize on it. Now with that in mind, we're, we're in Ephesians 6.14 tonight. This will be our 77th lesson Paul has introduced to us an aspect of spiritual life that's very critical, something we need to know about, that we are facing opposition that's stronger than we are. It's only he that's in us that's greater. Yeah, person to person, these forces are greater. They're unseen, which, see, that puts you at a decided disadvantage right away. They're unseen. They're not seen. They're spiritual forces. They're powers that actually have dominated the whole world. I mean, it's, it's something that a person would have to contend with this. Powers that had dominated the whole world. They're aggressive. They press the battle. They don't wait for something trouble to rise up. They cause the trouble. And they operate under the prince of the power of the air. Now, Paul is informing us that there is a provision in salvation to address this situation, and it's called the whole armor of God. It enables us to stand against the wiles of the devil. That is, the armor will render us capable of not being outwitted by Satan. The simple souls are snared by the devil because they're not aware of his craftiness. 
So the wiles of the devil have to do with his strategies and his approaches and his purposes, what he intends to do. He's crafty. Now Paul now he introduces another facet. He's introduced another facet of warfare. There he said this is, he talked about putting down the whole armor of God so you could stand. But then there's another posture, there's withstand. In the evil day, we stand against the wiles of the devil. That's the tactics. We withstand in the evil day a special military attack. And withstand and stand aren't the same thing. Stand is against temptation or to the against tactics. In other words, you're not vulnerable. But the evil day is when a special initiative is launched like that against Job. The wiles of the devil, they take the form of false doctrines, false teachings, imaginations. See? But the evil day, that's like storms, like snake bites, like ships, wrecks. It's a different type of attack. So you got a twofold. One has to do with your mind, and the other has to do with your body. Both of them are satanic initiatives, and you've got to be able to withstand them. The armor does. The church of Smyrna was told they were going to endure a trial. There has to be this, now they're going to have to withstand a trial, special trial. Here's what Jesus said to this church, fear, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Uh, that's a, that's a evil. Those ten days were an evil day. Yeah, right. yeah. History's been filled with both types of these attacks. Dill uses the false teaching, wiles of the devil and bloody persecutions, evil day. Mm -hmm. yeah. At this present time, our country is enduring a vicious assault of ideas. Delusion. Stick. It's in the world at large, it's in the church, professed church, there's false notions that are being launched against the body of Christ. In the third world countries, the evil days, bloody persecutions and outward, that's been launched in the third world, but this is what's been launched in the western world. Two different fronts. In this case, our education's against us. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may not be fashionable to say this, but let me tell you. Yeah. The more educated you are, the more false notions and doctrines Satan hurls at you. That's right. The more simplistic your life is, the more he hurls this other stuff at you. And sometimes he's, he mixes them up. But the whole armor of God is adequate mm -hmm. for uh, both those situations. <clears throat> now here's our text. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Amen. Now notice the kind of admonition that he gives here. He doesn't say, now, now try your best to do better. Or as some would say, keep a stiff upper lip. You know. Keep a good attitude now. Try your best to think positively. Keep negative thoughts away. And lead a life of greater discipline now. Get a handle on your life. See, he doesn't talk that way. Instead, he summons us to focus our association upon our standing before God. Stand. 
therefore, as you, brethren, you've been brought, so to speak, within seeing distance of the living God. Stand there. You can get in a position where you can't sense God. Yeah, this is possible. I mean, you've all experienced this. When you're just, you're dull. Stand means don't stay in this circumference. We're with you in sight of the homeland, within sight of the homeland, within a sense of where you can perceive God. As soon as you can, life, the normalities of life can make you drift outside that circumference to where you're not really living in an awareness of God. You're thinking about your job or your home or your family or whatever, but you're outside the circumference. Stand, don't. Don't get out of that area. Actually, this standing is the result of walking in the Spirit and living by faith. It's the result of doing that. Although uh, they become very popular, special programs and disciplines lack the power of God. That's their weakness. That's their weakness. God will not empower Amen. those methodologies. And therefore, they are useless in the good fight of faith. They're little more than a means of making people rely on human wisdom. Stand. See, that, that lifts you up out of that quagmire in your thought. Therefore, uh, there's that word again. I think he's thinking words, you know. He keeps... He keeps encouraging you to think right. Therefore, other versions say then. God's word says so then. The New American Bible says so. Living by says to do this, to stand. To do this, or so then. The word from which therefore is translated means the following, then, therefore, accordingly, consequently, these things being so. That is, this is a sanctified conclusion. Yeah, He's told us we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, brethren. Yeah, yeah. We're wrestling against principalities and powers, the wickedness in high places and the spiritual it rules the darkness of the world and spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, in view of that, here's the conclusion we got to reach. Yeah. Uh -huh. we got to stand. Amen. Amen. Considering what we're resting against should lead us to this conclusion. See, there are people that are, they live slipshod, spiritually slipshod, here, there, and here and there, here, there, and yon, waffling back and forth. Why? They don't see this, what they're wrestling against. You, if you think for one moment that these principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of the world and spiritual wickedness in high places will just sit and watch you while you waffle, <laughs> Well, you're just wrong, that's all. They're going to leap right in there. As soon as they find you waffling, they're going to throw something at you that won't let you waffle, and you'll always topple over on their side. That's, so standing becomes essential. Be, yes? Standing is a sign that shows alertness, and if you're, you're distracted... If you're not if you're not standing yeah. wandering to and fro blown about like that's right every wind of doctrine then that opens up the door for them it, it makes it easier for them to knock you over that's right amen <laughs> Babel and the great <laughs> has instituted a an approach to quote Christianity, that teaches people so they can't arrive at proper conclusions. Yeah, that's right. Amen. I'm not exaggerating when I say this. 
That's why in churches there's always a lot of questions. People have questions. Why is it this way? Why is it that way? We don't want to sanctify a bunch of question asking. We understand that sometimes there's questions. We understand that. But you've got to get to the point where you quit asking questions. And you're able to see clear enough to draw some conclusions. Because questions are because people can't draw conclusions. I'm careful to say we're not against questions. We're not discouraging questions. That's not what we're saying. But you really got to grow out of the question asking stage. And you got to get to the point where you, the God set the facts before you. So there's no need really, really, if you get right down to it, God's given us enough information, there shouldn't be any questions. But when you can't assimilate that information and you can't add it up right and you can't collect it together right, and you can't put things together right, you have to ask questions. we understand that? Yeah. We don't condemn anybody for asking them. But our aim is, it, is to teach people so they can make some conclusions. Yeah. Yes? Not, not to ask so many questions is a mark of growth. That's when, right. When children are little, they ask a lot of questions because they don't. They're not able to make the connections, and they don't That's understand. Right. Mm -hmm. But as they grow, they don't ask as many questions. That's right. Mm -hmm. See, when the apostle writes, Jesus was the same way, he would draw the conclusion for you. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that's what he's doing. He's, he's, actually, we should be able to draw this conclusion ourselves, but he's, he's a teacher sent from God, so he's not going to rely on people just doing that. He knows if they grow up, they'll be able to say, oh, so, oh, I can see it now. I can see now. Then my life is just not me trying my best to make it through the world. I'm under attack by a foe that's smarter and more crafty than me. So I conclude I got to hold my ground. Now, all I need to know is how I'm going to hold it. And he's telling you, all right, I'm, I'm telling you how to hold your ground now is to put on the whole armor of God. So he's supplying information to us. People that have been taught to arrive at wrong conclusions. Now, listen, some people read the same Bible that you read, and they come up with the conclusion that someday God's going to, Jesus is going to sneak the church out of the world. And the Antichrist is going to come. The Holy Spirit is going to leave. And, but yet some people are going to be converted. And Jesus is going to come back again. He's going to sit on a throne in Jerusalem and reign a thousand years. Where do all those ideas come from? Anyone that's honest knows they're not taught in the Bible. They are an assembly of disconnected thoughts, a little bit from Daniel, a little bit from Zechariah, a little bit from Revelation, a little bit from Matthew, and we put it all together and come up with a conclusion. But it's the wrong conclusion. When you read what has been said about the end of the world, the day of judgment, the coming of Jesus, the Antichrist and all that, a proper conclusion is, i got to get ready for this. That's a proper conclusion. You see what I'm saying? I may be a little clumsy in teaching this, but this thing about reaching proper conclusions, this is a very, very weak part of most Christians' lives. They Thinking is their weak point. They can't think right. When the apostles would reason wrong, the Lord would say, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. They'd say, oh, <laughs> we didn't bring bread. Wrong conclusion, but it irritated Jesus. Is your heart still hard? Don't you understand yet? You think he doesn't feel this way when someone's been a Christian 10, 15, 20 years and they still can't make sense out of what's been revealed? You think that's really that innocent? No, it's not. Not at all. So Paul's he's going to deliver the conclusion to us. Tell us what needs to be done. Stand. That's, that's, that's the conclusion. 
This was translated a number of ways to different versions. Stand firm, take your place, take your stand, stand fast, stand your ground, hold a position, stand strong, stand ready, hold your ground. See, it's all, don't be pushed backward. Don't yield some ground. Now, scriptural words that speak of this stand, there's scriptural words that look at the standing from different viewpoints. Peter uses the word establish. Right? That's, that's, a, that's a facet of standing. The psalmist said, my heart is fixed. He doesn't mean fixed like it was out of repair and I fixed it. He means fixed means like glued down. See, that's another aspect of standing. In Hebrews, steadfast. See, that's another word. It has to do with standing. Unmovable. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Faithful. Revelation 2, 10. Firm. Hebrews 3, 6. Rooted and grounded. Ephesians 5, 17. Established in the faith. Colossians 2, 7. See, these are talking about standing. That's what this is all talking about, standing. Now, there are word pictures in Scripture that portray in a sort of a parabolic form what standing means. Yes. Yes. Reminded of this text in Jeremiah, for he shall be as a tree planted yeah. by the water, <laughs> and that right. spreadeth out her roots by the river, yeah. and shall yeah. not see the heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding Amen. fruit. Amen. Yeah. As we stand, we're yielding fruit. That's and right. Our roots are spread, so we can. Be yeah, standing. Standing isn't yielding the fruit. Standing is staying firm, so you can. That was one of the word pictures we're going to have. Yes. Only when I hear staying fast in the scripture, rather than just like, you know, just the stands itself just standing, rather I had the picture of like a soldier like being in a stance of resistance with a shield, like ready to take a strike or something, as to like to prevent from being pushed back. Yeah. Yes. Isaiah used the word trees of righteousness. Yes, a depiction of. Standing, or a house founded on a rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's been historical examples of someone who was able to stand, hold their ground, not yield any. The Philistines on one occasion came against Israel. They gathered together as a troop. And they met in a piece of ground full of lentils. And the Israelites all fled away. They were unable to stand against them. But Shammah, a man named Shammah, this is a troop. Aha, this is not just one person. Right. This is a troop. Shammah took his position in the middle of that field. Yeah. And he defended it and slew the Philistines until his hand was weary. He slew that the Lord wrought a great victory that day. Yeah, yeah. That's standing. It just doesn't mean you stand per you just stand like this, perpendicular. Mm -hmm. Your feet may be planted, but your sword's not idle. Mm -hmm. And then there's another picture of this. One of David's mighty three men, Eliezer, mm -hmm. who stood when they battle the Philistines as it said of him he rose he arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword and the Lord wrought a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to spoil one man yes there's, a, there's another uh, aspect of this we're told to stand but we know that that it's of the Lord that he causes us to stand. Yeah, yes. And I, I think of, of times whenever 
it's like our stance is to look to the Lord. And this is what we desire. We don't want to fall away. We don't want to be turned out of the way. We, we want to, but in doing that, we're, we're relying on Him. Um, I can remember when the, the kids were little, and uh, if the ground were uneven, you'd be holding their hand. And if they went to stumble, you could feel mm -hmm. their hand start to, to grab yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah. And it was like an instantaneous, just as soon as you felt that begin, your hand claps harder on them. And it's like as we stand... We're, we've got our hand, as it were, in the Amen. Lord's, mm -hmm. and He'll make us not to stumble. And He'll, that's why we can be confident yeah. in these things, because mm -hmm. we know that we're not up against the devil Amen. in our own strength, that God's just backing up and saying, all right now, I, I set you up there, don't, don't you dare fall, and then just hands off. Yeah. But rather, even whenever it's difficult, even whenever we feel as though we're struggling, we know that underneath are the everlasting arms, and that he's not willing that any should perish. So we know that he is for us in these times. And um, I, I think, that's our, at least mine, it's my greatest confidence. Amen. But see, that's why in both those instances, mm -hmm. it said the Lord wrought a great victory. It didn't say Shema wrote a, or Eliezer wrote wrought. The Lord wrought a great victory. So they fought this in faith. But here's, here's how it works. When a person refuses to budge, here comes divine strength. Yeah, that's right. If they waffle, they're on their own. Because waffling is unbelief. Yeah, that's, right. that's what it is. It's unbelief. The fact that we're strongly admonished, put on the whole armor of God, affirms that this isn't just a mere option, putting it on. It's an absolute necessity. Now, no person, no matter how gifted or intelligent they are, with their natural abilities, they cannot withstand these enemies. That's what Brother Sister June is bringing out here. That's why trust in the Lord is imperative. Because there's no way that you of yourself are capable of standing. Amen. What men refer to as mistakes, errors in judgment, a mental lapse, are really the revelation of the fact that they didn't put on the whole armor. Mm -hmm. That's what it reveals. Stand therefore then. means that failing to stand is not acceptable. Men must seek to think that this is a divine trait, that God has been enabled to ignore disobedience of men and bless them anyway. That is an erroneous idea. That's why he gives us gospel armor, the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God, Having your loins girt about with truth. Now the Spirit is going to give us a micro view of the whole armor. The whole armor is a macro view. The whole snapshot of the whole thing. See, Now he's going to get down to microscopic detail it a bit more. While the armor is single, it's comprised of different parts like a body is or like the church is. Now notice what he says, having, having. Other versions read with, that is in this condition. Some read first, having. So what we're going to read about is to armor what repentance is to faith. Before you put on this armor, there's something that has to be done. The loins must be girt about. Loins, physiologically, 
refers to from the waist down to your bottom of your hips. It's your loins. It's where you derive your strength for running and walking and so forth. But it's also the place where a man's generative strength is located. Loins girt about with truth. The seed of your strength has got to be have the belt of truth. Fasten around it. See, in Christ's kingdom, there's no room made for theory or supposition. Yeah, amen. Yep. Not gird yourself about with the theory of evolution. Mm -hmm. Gird yourself about with the law of hermeneutics. Huh? Mm -hmm. huh? Gird yourself about with a lot of scholarship and education. See, men do this. No, you gird yourself about with truth. Having, having, this is preparatory work. Having, gird yourself with, about with truth. Truth, what, what, what does that mean? You know, Pilate once asked Jesus, what is truth? People still ask him that question. It's not as easy to answer as you may think. Other versions read verity. That's a pretty good word. Lexically, the word truth means in reality, in fact, certainly, free from affection. It's interesting that what meaning was in there. It doesn't, it doesn't tie in with feelings at all. Free from pretense, simulation, or falsehood. In the English language, truth means the state of being the case. That's the way it is. It's fact. The body of real things and events and facts, actuality. And in the English dictionary, a transcendent, fundamental, or spiritual reality. Now, a considerable part of the wisdom of the world, if not all of it, is comprised by theory and supposition. There's great bodies of knowledge, natural knowledge, human knowledge, wisdom of the world, that its building blocks are theories and suppositions. That can't be part of what you gird your loins with. It can't be somebody's idea about what the scriptures say or somebody's idea about who God is or someone's idea about what Christ is. It can't be that. Just, you've got to get ready to put on the gospel armor by girding your loins about with truth. God's made no room for human thought, in human thought, for theory, supposition, in imaginations. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Hmm. What a truth, huh? This matter of truth in, in facts. That the truth will, have, will be factual, but a fact is not necessarily equivalent to truth. Because the, in, the, in the scriptures, there were a lot of things that could be called facts yeah. that Israel could have reasoned on, and yet they couldn't come to the knowledge of the truth. So truth is transcendent to all other information that can be yeah, known. Well, yeah, fact. It's knowledge, I should say. Yeah, fact. In this case, fact could not be classed under information. It's it's a fact that exists in God's eyes. It's a fact. But it's elevated. I mean, yeah. it's not, it, it, it may have, it's only a facet of the truth. The truth is much bigger. Oh, yes, than I understand what you're saying, yes. Well, truth is made up of these realities, things that really are. If he says, my peace I give unto you, peace is a very, it's a reality. Yeah, amen. It's not just an idea. 
And David said, The truth of the Lord endures forever. <laughs> and Solomon said, Buy the truth and sell it not. Get a hold of this. Peter said, We're established in the truth. First Peter 1 Peter 1.12 But what exactly is truth? Particularly as it's used here. Jesus himself defined it as, is, as it is to be used. On the night of his betrayal, he prayed, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. Now that's, that's tailored for humanity. Thy word is truth. It's a statement of reality. If God says all have sinned, that's, that's the way it is. Amen. That's the fact of the matter. Amen. If he says there's none righteous, that's, that's the fact of the matter. It's the way it is. Jesus himself, as I say, defined it by saying, sanctify them through thy... Okay, we're talking about God's truth. We're not talking about what men call truth. You can't be sanctified independently of God's truth. God's word is a statement of reality. It's the revelation of the facts that are pertinent to men and their salvation. So it's the reality of how the world was created. God told the real facts. He gave a factual definition of morality. He's made known how and why humanity came into being. It's all declared in his word. See, so people, they are theistic evolutionists. They believe God created the world by evolution. These men should be expelled from the church. Whoever they got their credentials, that institution should be blackballed by the church. The church has got to get serious about this because there's been too much contamination. If God has spoken on that subject, yeah. we refuse to hear anyone's opinion on it. Amen. I know I don't want to hear it. No. See, the real enemy is defined by God. The actual Savior is defined by God. When it comes to purpose and objective and intention, God tells you what the real intention is. All the intentions of men will fall. Yes. The truth will make you free. Make you free. It gives us an indication of the nature of deception being. Um, it, it, it binds. Binds, it, it, yeah. It wraps yes. you up and, and, and twists you up. Where it's not just a matter of being being free from it. It's not just a matter of a decision. Of turning this way or, or the right way or a different way. The truth can make you free is like free freeing a prisoner from one power, from someone who has power uh, over. And evolution is one of the, is, is an example of that. Oh, where yes. The, that, that deception finds its way, it crawls its way into all different areas of, of thinking and experience and thought and, and it infects. It infects all different kinds and makes it. Uh, it, it end up making a making it where a person can't think. With yeah, the truth. amen. Can't, can't amen. process. Uh -huh. And another, you know, the making the truth making you free is has a very real experience to it. You can get your hands around it yeah. to where the Lord can give you a word like faith is the substance of thing hoped mm -hmm. for, and just the statement will free you. <laughs> amen. It'll just make you free and just clear things up, and just you're just you can just be free from. Whatever distraction or, mm -hmm. or burden or confusion or it, I mean I've I've experienced it. Where it just, Amen. It's just gone, and it's a, it's that's fruit of the truth making you free. Amen, mm -hmm. brother Given. I think now a key to that is I like this that you had up here earlier where you said now the truth is free from pretense and <laughs> uh, some other things like that. Now it's the purest thought 
God, and then, of course, thy word is true. And that's the purest thought a man can have because it's free from all these contaminants. That's right. Amen. And, it, and actually, like Brother Aaron was saying, to be free is actually to free us from all these contaminants. That's right. And the word, the God's word is so pure. Mm-hmm. It's the purest thought a man can have. It'll actually free you mm. from all these uh, contaminants. You know, pretense and mm-hmm. deceit and all these other things. Amen. Mm-hmm. Yes. A truth has a uh, has a connection with an environment with the spirit. Yeah, it it in the spirit not, of truth. It is not, it, when it, you can't receive the truth disaffected of God. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. You can't mm-hmm. Because uh, they that love the truth. Are, are ones that are drawn to God. Their affection is set on Him. There's more to truth. You can say the words, and a person can ref- they can they can know the form of the truth, the same as the person that yeah. believes it. But the one that believes it has the truth. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Now, so far as the real message addressed to men. The truth of the gospel. That's the that's the message that unlocks everything, puts it together. But here the point he's making here is before the whole armor can be put on, one must possess the knowledge of the truth. <laughs> you gotta really see this. He's gotta be girt about, he's got he's got to be surrounded. By the truth, he's got a grasp of the truth. He's not going to be able to put this armor on if he doesn't. Yeah, right. This is how you prepare. Yeah. He tells believers, put on the whole armor of yeah. God, having mm-hmm. yeah. your loins girt about yeah, right. with the truth. <laughs> the very real facts of God and Christ, <laughs> sin and the devil... All the things that God has made known, you've got to have some kind of a grasp. Yes, amen. You can't be a baby in these things. Yeah. This armor to a person who doesn't know the truth is like Saul's armor was to David. It just doesn't yeah. fit. Amen. The armor only fits people who have a knowledge uh-huh. of the truth. See, and we're faced with a generation that has not been schooled in the truth. Oh, there's been an enormous amount of preaching and seminars and colleges and education, but people don't know the truth. Why don't they? Because they haven't been taught. And so they they can't put on the whole armor. See, it's one thing to know you got to put it on. It's something else to be ready to put it on. You know, all of you aren't in this class. But there's some people that for years and years, 15, 20 years since we've been here, and things are just now coming together. Hmm? After 15 or 20 years. Why is it that way? It's because this delusion has been spread abroad and truth has not been spoken. Men going to have the belt of truth on, they got to be hearing the truth. Put it on. <coughs> That's a revolutionary thought to me. What Paul said to the Galatians about Peter withdrawing from the Gentiles. Yeah. I think that is an evidence of the entangling nature. Yeah. The Lord had given him a vision yeah. about what God hath cleansed, call not thou common. And I don't know how much how much longer or how, how much time had elapsed from that vision yeah. to when, when Paul had to had, he withstood him? Yeah, you know? I think I don't think I don't think Peter didn't know that. Mm-hmm. I think he knew it very very well, but he it was, it was his act. It was he it was what he did was interpreted as meaning mm-hmm. the Gentiles were unclean. So it's what he did, not what he said, because he had just got through in the Jerusalem conference, saying they'll be saved by the grace of God, just like we are. So. It was his act that left the wrong impression. That's why he was rebuked. He shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have acted 
He sort of acted in conformity with what he knew. In other words, yeah. But he, you're right about the length of time. He, he would have been more aware of his action. Well, Jesus was it was with his disciples three years. This is the Son of God we're talking about. Teaching them day and night, they always were with him, and they, boy, they didn't catch on. They had to have the Holy Spirit come down from heaven before they could put it together. Having the loins girded about with the truth. Well, so you ask yourself the question, how acquainted am I with the truth? Is there great segments of the scripture with which I'm not familiar? Well, you've got to be correct in that. And, oh, so that's not all. Preparatory work, that's not all. And having, remember you said put on, now we're talking about Having. We're not even down to what you take up yet. Yeah. Having the breastplate of righteousness. See, the protective armor, that's a shield and the helmet. And the offensive armor, that's the sword. We haven't even got to that yet. Right. We haven't got to that yet. This is all preparatory, preparatory work. So you can... Uh, Take up the shield and put on the helmet. Right, so that we're not in the fighting posture yet. This is all preparatory. Having on. Some verses say having put on. See, it's already on. With it in place. The breastplate of righteousness. Now different versions translate this a number of ways. Some of them are terrible. Put on God's approval as your breastplate. Wrong. Put on uprightness as a breastplate. Right. Put on God's righteousness. Wrong. Put on the breastplate of uprightness. Right. Uprightness is a dead breastplate. Right. God's righteousness. Wrong. The breastplate of up, uprightness, right. Right doing is a coat of mail, right. Let God's justice protect you. That's pure baloney. I don't know where the... That's terrible. Breastplate of justice. That's the Catholic Bible. And the breastplate of integrity and moral rectitude and right standing with God. That's amplified. That's pretty good. That's not what the words literally say, but that's a good good <laughs> interpretation of them. So as you can see, the, the various versions present a variety of views. The blessed plate is thus described as God's approval, God's righteousness, uprightness, right doing, God's justice or justice. Some of these views are just uh, expression of distorted theology and they made it part of scripture. That's what they did. It's man's approach to Scripture that's allowed. Yes, right. Amen. See, men have approached Scripture like it's a fundamentally a literary document, yes, uh -huh. and it's understood by human understanding, and they've approached the Bible that way, and so that's allowed them to insert this. Now, here are the righteousness of reference. is not imputed righteousness. Uh, some, some commentators think it is, but there's, I'm going to take exception to it. This is not imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness is not something you put on. Yeah, that's right. Amen. That's right. right? Yeah. I will concede that if you talk about putting on the new man, he's created in righteousness. So in that, in that mm -hmm. there's something to that I can see. But the righteousness of God in being imputed to us is for God's, so God will recognize us and accept us. The nature of this text does not allow us to think of righteousness as imputed to us by God. That gives an excuse to some people. Yeah. Imputed righteousness is not righteous, as I've said, that we put on at all. It's created within us. That's the imputed is he's 
It's created with you. Now, theologians have talked about imputed righteousness and infused righteousness, which is when you really, really are righteous. They call it infused righteousness, but this, I don't like that, uh, that language. So here, righteousness is, has reference to do it, has to do with godliness or holiness that results from living by faith. Now, the scriptures speak about this kind of righteousness. This is a breastplate that protects you. Your personal righteousness and integrity. Here's how the scriptures speak about it. Romans 6.13. Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. He also said in verse 18, he spoke of obedience unto righteousness and being servants of righteousness. This righteousness is classed together with peace and joy. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14, 17. Our involvement in righteousness is confirmed by a word Paul said to the Corinthians. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Righteousness is called a fruit of the Spirit, Ephesians 5, 9. Other qualities that are fruit of the Spirit are things you do. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Those are all things you do, not things that are imputed to you. They're not imputed to you. This is a righteousness that is to be pursued. Yeah. Pursue righteousness with godliness, faith, and patience. 2 Timothy 3.16 It said of people of faith living before us, who through faith subdued kingdoms wrought righteousness. That's what we're talking about. Talking about this godly life. This righteousness is called the peaceable fruit that comes from chastening. In Hebrews 12, 11. It's the end for which Jesus died that we might live unto righteousness. 1 Peter 3, 14. Now this righteousness is unlike imputed righteousness. As John said, everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. 1 John 2, 29. First, uh, First John three seven, he that doeth righteousness is righteous. Right, that's the righteousness he's talking about here. That you put on. How is it that we have a breastplate for protection when there's a shield that's over all? We got to address that, I think. Or oh, above all, that didn't mean first priority. It meant over everything else at this complete shield, complete protection. Why is it you have to have a breastplate if you got this shield? Well, find the shield of faith is to quench the fiery darts. Where's this spilled out? The fiery darts, temptations of the wicked one. The wiles of the devil. See? I'm sure you see where we're going here. But there's more a direct assaults that aren't don't come through temptation. I'll name you some of them. Doubt, fear, even ignorance. That's like a face to face. What's gonna protect you when eyeball your eyeball to eyeball with the devil, so to speak? What's gonna protect you? We're not dealing with the shield of faith here. You didn't have it up. <laughs> here come this now. You always there. You are. If you're not righteous, Satan will get you down. He'll pummel you. Oh, he'll pummel you. You lived a sloppy life. You got sin in your life. You know you got sin in your life. You know how God feels about it, but you haven't addressed it. When Satan gets hold of you. Ever, of you, he'll go, he's going to hammer you hard. 
But if you got on the breastplate of righteousness, yeah. Je Satan won't be able to go any further with you than he went with Jesus. Right. Your righteousness will protect you. Your godliness will protect you when you're under an assault, an immediate assault. This righteousness is effectively taught to us by the, whole, by the grace of God, which teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, teaches us righteously and godly in this present world. Where this righteousness is not found, to some extent you're vulnerable to the wicked one. But where it's found, it's a breastplate that protects your vital. Breastplate protects your vital. You may get something in the leg. There's vital organs. they got to be protected. Your, your soul has vital parts that's got to be protected. And righteousness will protect you. Remember the Lord said, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Right, yeah. Righteous God in living. Anyone today knows that if you view the contemporary church, you don't think of righteousness. <laughs> you don't think of holiness. That's not what you think of. And if you do, someone says, well, you're being judgmental now. God's will, God's able to overlook it. You should be able to overlook it too. Well, tell it to Jesus, because he sure didn't overlook it. When your sin was on Jesus, God didn't overlook it, did he? He didn't pay the penalty. Jesus didn't overlook it when he talked to the churches in the first three chapters. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. Now, this is my personal feeling that it's, in our time, enough's not being made of the necessity of righteousness. Enough's not being made of it. It's plain enough. Now, we... We don't have to bend corners and twist words and come up with fancy arguments. It's, it's stated plain enough in Scripture, so if people just are told about it. It's plain enough that this is something that uh, needs to be pursued. And beside that, he tells us that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So that throw that into the pot of thought, and you come up with the conclusion, I'm going to put on this breastplate. See, because you can't put on a feigned righteousness won't, is not an adequate breastplate. You wouldn't say to Satan, well, I went through the 12 steps and I made it through them pretty well. I think that the church world is cluttered with carcasses of people who fell to the Satan because they didn't have the breastplate of righteousness. They were not personally righteous. They did not live righteous. They weren't serving unto righteousness. They weren't walking toward righteousness. They weren't listening to the Spirit teaching them how to live righteously, see. Now, I understand that in the case of novices, that's another, that's another matter. God protects those that are just beginning the babes. He carries them in his arms. He carries the lambs in his bosom. That's what, <laughs> that's what Isaiah said. He carries, carries the lambs in his bosom. He protects them. But when they start walking, they got to have this righteousness. Now, you see, we haven't even got to some of the other matters to be done, and we're already seeing before you take up your weapons, yeah. your off defensive and offensive weaponry, there's some certain things had to be in place, and this is what they are. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. So I'll leave it to you to judge yourselves in this matter, how righteous you are. I've got I'm, I have enough work to examine myself. Are you a righteous, godly, holy person? Are you? If you are, it's because of the strength God gave you and you apprehended it. If you aren't, you are in danger. And everything's been provided for that condition not to continue. You don't have to work your way out of it. 
There's a, there's a way he can, he can forgive you all your trespasses yes. and strengthen you with might by his spirit in the inner man. So Christ can dwell in your heart by faith and you can become rooted and grounded. And then you can, you can wear this breastplate of righteousness. I think I'll stop there. Any of you have something you'd like to add? Brother Ricky. Joseph is such an excellent example of doing righteousness. That's right. That's right. You know, Joseph, he could have, when he was sold into slavery into Egypt, he could have been consumed with bitterness over his brothers. But we know that he wasn't because he was a faithful steward in Potiphar's yes. house under temptation by Potiphar's wife. And see, his doing righteousness in that regard enabled him to be a faithful steward when he was required to go down into prison. And then he was faithful there yes. against different kind of temptations that are associated with personal affliction and suffering and being lowly and things like that. But see, doing righteousness there enabled him to to uh, take over Egypt when the time was right. So Amen. He, over his whole life, he, he shows a marvelous consistency of doing righteousness so that when he faced any kinds of temptations, they weren't able to penetrate and get into his heart. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes, Sister Annie. I um, was considering you speaking of this breastplate, that in warfare, men will aim where their opponent's <clears throat> armor is weak or where their opponent has no armor. That's right. So if we're not wearing this breastplate, <laughs> then that is where Satan will aim. That's right. That's right. It makes right. us vulnerable, Amen. doesn't it? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, unless a person has received a genuine love for the truth, that they might be saved and, and has a genuine desire to, to please the Lord in, in everything that he does, that he, he does it unto the Lord, he, he's, really, he's, he's not prepared. You know, I've, I've encountered a lot of people, all they want to do is argue with the Bible and, and, and win their point or their, their thought. Mm -hmm. But see, this, this is like these kind of people, they, they're, not, they're, they're not qualified to, to even wield the sword. That'll actually be a disadvantage to them because they, they, they can't make proper conclusions. So mm -hmm. most of their thoughts are segmented. And, and they say, well, I have a Bible verse on that, but it doesn't mean what it says. And it actually produces more, more uh, um, deception and, and um, confusion. You said about the, the, the loins being girded by the truth. Whatever you supposedly believe or profess, you will propagate it. It will. It, 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 you'll just start talking about it. And, but what if you're wrong? What if you're misrepresenting God? This is a, this is a, a very personally harmful thing. Yeah. And it's spreading, you know, like, you know, and this is a good thing. Hey, Brother Tony. I tell you what will go a long way to helping a person live godly and righteous is to try to get away from any kind of environment that's, that's not as much as possible. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. As much as in you lies. That's right. That's right. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we ask now for grace to put on the breastplate of righteousness and be found qualified to take up the whole armor of God and stand against the wiles and the strategies and attacks of the devil. We thank you for this armor. And we intend by your grace to put it on in its entirety. In Jesus' name, amen.